From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Matter up, Johnny. Ah, who's that? McGraw! Oh, as if I didn't know. What's on your mind, Bert? Dollar Mason. Ever hear of her? Her uncle Sylvester Mason. Mm, Mason stealing iron? Yeah, that's the man. Dollar's his favorite niece. About six weeks ago, she disappeared. So? So, yesterday, a body washed up on Newport Beach not too far from her parents' home. Dollar's? According to her father... And you hold a policy on her? For 25000 double indemnity. Ouch. So, why don't you pay it off? Well, we would have today, except for one thing. Well, what's that? Right after Mason identified the body, a man named Dixon showed up and swore it was the body of his daughter. What? Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Providential Assurance Company, 393 Dewey Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Mason-Dixon mismatch matter. Expense account item one, $1.20, taxi from my apartment at the Providential Building. The walls of Bert McGraw's office are covered with pictures of sporting events. And as I entered, Bert was preparing to hang another one. Oh, Johnny, well, come in, come in. Uh, you, uh, you ever see this? Uh, who is it? Who? Well, it's me, that's who. The day I pitched for the Valdosta Lions. Struck out ten of the cherry pointers that afternoon. Yes, sir. Uh, you win the game for him? Huh? I said, did you win the game for him? Oh. Uh, no, cheating umpire. <laughs> Well, Johnny boy, you ready to join our little team? I don't know. The body of a girl being found on a beach, Mason identifying it as his daughter, then somebody else showing up. Uh, Henry Dixon. Yeah, and saying the same thing. Can't the authorities identify her? Haven't been able to yet. Neither one of those girls had their fingerprints on record? Nope. Well, what about dental work? Uh, nothing to go on there either. Oh, brother. It's not going to be an easy one, Johnny. How long had the body been in the ocean before it was washed up? Well, they figure about six weeks. You know what that means. Yeah. Hello? Oh, yes, sir. I see. Uh-huh. Well, if it isn't the Mason girl... Yes, sir. Yes, sir, that's right. Well, thanks for calling, Captain. That was Captain Miller of the Newport Police. They find out who she is? No. So if it is the Mason girl, we're going to have to pay out 50000 on the double indemnity clause. You aren't surprised, are you? No, I didn't think she died from a natural cause. But I didn't think it'd be from a gunshot wound, either. What kind of a gunshot wound? A thirty-eight, right through here. Mm. How old did you say the Mason girl was, Bert? Oh, around 20. Dixon girl, too. Both of them pretty, full of life. At least they were. When did the Mason girl disappear? Oh, about six weeks ago. And the Dixon girl? Well, she's been missing about three months. Well, one of them's still alive. I'll try to find her. Bert gave me all the information he had on both the Mason and the Dixon families. I took a cab back to my apartment. That's expense account item two. Item three, $18.10 transportation, Hartford to Newport, Rhode Island. After checking in at the Ogden Hotel, I called Dollar Mason's father, rented a car, and drove out to the Mason home on the beach. I was about to ring the bell when the front door opened. Hi. Well, hi. You must be Johnny Dollar. That's right. Come on in. I'm Joan Mason. Dollar's little sister. Uh Uh-huh. This way, Mr. Dollar. Mother's waiting for you in the den. Your mother? I thought my appointment was with you. Oh, my father's indisposed. Besides, mother's the brains of this family. Of course, if you really want to know about Darla, you ask me. Maybe I will. You better. Mr. Dollar's here, Mother. Thank you, my dear. Come in, please, Mr. Dollar. See you later, Johnny. 
dreadful mistake my husband made has upset him so. I thought it best to see you myself. Just what mistake are you referring to, Mrs. Mason? Well, we've released a statement to the newspapers. I thought you had heard. No, ma'am, I haven't. You've made a trip over here for nothing, then. Oh. Yes, you see, my husband erred when he identified that body as being our daughter's. It couldn't possibly have been. Well, uh, I know you're glad of that, Mrs. Mason. But what made Mr. Mason change his mind? I haven't changed it, Dollar. George, I, I thought you were going to stay in your room. Never mind. Dollar, any questions you want to ask, I'll try to answer them. Why, why, George Mason, you've been drinking. Only enough to take the bad taste out of my mouth. And you know what put it there. I, oh, I, don't I, look so mixed up, Jenny. I tried going along with you, but I got too weak a stomach. So here I am. I don't know what you're talking about. No. Listen, Dollar. As soon as they found out that girl had been murdered, my wife here decided it couldn't have been Dollar. It isn't Dollar, and you know it. Only thing I know is that you've got a set idea good, proper people don't die nowhere else but in bed. Because this girl died like she did, because she was shot, you tried convincing me she ain't our daughter. Well, I won't hold still for it. That girl's dollar, no matter what that if crazy Coot Dixon says. Me, or Mr. what you dollar? say. Surely. You hear? You hear me, Jenny? Oh. Doggone woman. I get so mad at her. Oh, you. Yeah. You want a drink, Dollar? No, no thanks. A little early for me. Yeah, I guess I've had enough, too. Well, Dollar. No matter what way our girl died, she was a good girl. Never give me a bit of trouble. Never lied. Never ran around like some her age do. Oh, she was a real good girl. Mr. Mason, the police haven't been able to make a positive identification. I know that. Well, would you mind telling me why you're so certain that girl is your daughter? Oh, of course not. First thing, Darla had no reason to run off. She had everything I could give her. Charge accounts all over the place. Everything money could buy. So... She had no reason to leave here like she did. Where was she last seen? At the Newport Yacht Club, at the bar. Younger daughter Joan saw Darla talking with a stranger. When she walked out of the club, it was the last anybody ever saw of her. Well, Mr. Mason, do you have a picture of your daughter that I could borrow for a few days? Yeah, I might be able to find you one. What do you want with it? I'm going to try to find her. You what? Dollar, you... Or find the Dixon girl. Oh. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Well, you might locate Ruth Dixon somewhere. Do you know the Dixons, Mr. Mason? No, I never heard of them before this happened. What about Ruth Dixon? Could Darla have known her? Oh, of course not. Are you sure? I mean, isn't it possible that in a small community like no, this one... No, no, it's not possible. Dollar, we're the Masons. Now, maybe that don't mean much to you or to me... But it means an awful lot to my wife. And for the time poor Darla was born, my wife drilled it into her. Do you understand? No, I'm not sure that I do. Well, Darla never mixed with people she thought were beneath her any more than my wife ever has. I see. You don't believe it, you just ask around. I plan to, Mr. Mason. <laughs> Mason found a small snapshot of his daughter. I took it and drove back to town. Expense account item four, ten cents, one phone call to Henry Dixon. Twenty minutes later, I walked through the knee-high weeds that surrounded the Dixon home. Standing on the front porch waiting for me was a tall, thin man. Afternoon, Mr. Dollar? Yes, that's right. Well, I'm glad to know you. Sit down. It's such a nice day, I thought we could talk out here on the porch. Fine with me. Oh, uh, Dollar... Yeah. Uh, look, th this whole thing hasn't been easy on my wife. Now, I've spent all day convincing her that I was mistaken, that the girl found on the beach isn't our daughter. You really believe that? Oh, I do, and so does my wife. And for the first time in days, she's almost her old self again. Henry? Oh, on the porch, Lucille. Mr. Dollar's here. Oh, my... It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Oh, Lucille, this is Mr. Dollar. Oh, pleased to meet you, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Dixon. Well, sit down, Mr. Dollar. Just anywhere. Oh, Henry built these chairs himself. I wanted to put them in the house, but Ruth, she just wouldn't have it. There. 
Yes, Mr. Dollar. <clears throat> I'm not at all sure why you want to see us. Ruth wasn't insured. We never could afford to take out a policy on her. Well, we did once for her college fund. You remember, Henry? Mm, yes, but when I was forced to slow down, we had to cash it in. All except about a thousand dollars, that is. Back in St. Louis, my husband was a school teacher, Mr. Dollar. A fine one. But the doctors made him give it up because of his heart. Oh, I see. Um, how long have you folks lived in Newport? Five years and four months. Mrs. Dixon, I imagine you remember just about everything that happened the day Ruth disappeared, don't you? Oh, my, yes. Well, did your daughter seem to be upset or emotionally disturbed in any way? No more than usual. Well, Ruth was spoiled, Mr. Dollar. Before Henry had to leave his job, we had the money to buy her nice things. Then, when we didn't have it, well, Ruth just never could get used to seeing her friends in their pretty new dresses. That's one of the reasons we moved to Newport, to get away from that crowd. Yes, we hoped she would find some friends on her own... Uh, financial level. Yes, some friends like that. But she... she wouldn't change. Did she know the Mason girl? Or ever talk about her? No, I can't recall that she did. Now, wait a minute, Henry. She did once. Oh, when was that? Oh, about the middle of March. They were having a dance where Ruth worked. When she got home that night, she told me the Mason girl had been there and how nice her hair had looked. Mm, the Mason girl wasn't nearly as pretty. Oh, no. Have you ever seen a picture of Ruth, Mr. Dollar? Uh, well, only the one in the newspapers. Oh, that doesn't look a thing like Ruth. Excuse me. Surely. Mr. Dixon, was Ruth happy with her job? Well, considering how little they pay girls for doing hostess work, she was. Now, here. Here's a real nice picture of her, Mr. Dollar. You just look at this. Mm. Isn't that something? She sure... Mrs. Dixon, where was this taken? Why, where she worked. At the Newport Yard Club. I borrowed the picture after promising to be careful with it. Then I went back to my hotel. At the desk, I stopped for my key and messages and found one from Captain Miller, the Newport police. He wanted to see me in his office as soon as possible. It took me about five minutes to get there. Dollar? Yeah, that's right. In the air. I mill a homicide detail. I'm glad you could... Oh, Mr. Oh, Dollar. Huh? Mr. Dollar, what wonderful good news. Now, Jenny, leave the man alone. Well, I, I didn't expect to find you people here, Mrs. Mason. No, no, I'm sure you didn't. And Mr. Mason didn't expect to be here either. Oh, you just wouldn't hold the thought, would you, George? You just wouldn't have faith. Oh, Jenny. You had our girl dead and buried in her grave. Oh, for heaven's sake. I never see anything so disgusting, Dollar. But she's not. No, sir. Oh, I'm so thankful. So very Mrs. Best. Mason, you mean you found her? They haven't found her yet, Dollar. As a matter we of fact... We found proof that she's alive. What kind of proof? A slip. A what? A little sail. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm so excited. Calm down, Jenny, for heaven's sake. I'll what did you find, Captain? I'm ready to I didn't Mason find it, Mrs. Mason. Well, oh, what is it? What is it? A, a bill from Kennedy's. Things. That's a department oh, store over in Providence. Oh, why don't you, you shut up, woman? Oh, Captain, oh. what's a bill got to do with Dollar Mason being alive? Just this. All the Masons have a charge account at Kennedy's. So? Yes, yes. So today a bill came to the Mason house addressed to Miss Dollar Mason. You hear? You yeah. Hear? Mrs. Mason opened it. Yes. Darla charged a fur wrap in Kennedy's. Oh. When? Just last week. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. We often hear about people shooting the bull or throwing the bull. We often do it ourselves on occasion. But here's a story about a bull that threw the man instead of the other way around. 
When Air Force veterinarian Captain Tony Kamalocker was stationed in the Azores, he was asked by a Portuguese veterinarian to diagnose the wound of a young and promising bull that had been gored by another bull. It came from a long line of famous Corrida bulls and was considered very valuable. But Captain Kamalocker's diagnosis was not favorable. An operation was needed, and there were no facilities for such a thing, just the young captain's bag of surgical instruments, a few strong field hands to hold the animal down, and Mrs. Kamalocker, who acted as nurse. The operating table was a rocky field under a penetrating drizzle of rain. But Captain Tony Kamalocker couldn't be stopped with mere inconveniences. After giving the bull a dose of tranquilizers and a shot of local anesthetic, he proceeded with surgery. Just as the operation was completed, the bull came to life. With a mighty lurch, it leaped to its feet, throwing the field hands aside like sticks, and, for thanks, immediately charged at the surgeon. But Kamalocker escaped over a nearby stone wall. The bull recovered, and its grateful owner renamed it Kamalocker for its debut in the ring, where, Portuguese style, it is against the law to kill the bull. That's how a simple act of kindness brought about new understanding, a step on the road to freedom, the right of all men, everywhere. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Mason-Dixon mismatch matter. After telling me that the Mason girl had used one of her charge accounts just five days before the body was discovered on the beach, Captain Miller produced the original sales slip. Written across the bottom of it was the name Darla Mason. I wish to heaven I could be positive it's really her signature. You mean you think it's a forgery, Captain? Well, I don't think anything yet. Mr. Darla, you believe it's Darla's signature, don't you? Well, I, I haven't anything to compare the signature with, Mrs. Mason. Mrs. Mason, do you happen to have any of your daughter's legal documents at home? Or her driver's license or anything else that might contain her signature? No, I'm afraid I don't. You can order a copy from the Department of Motor Vehicles, Captain. Yeah, I will. What do you want it for, Captain? Well, it's just a matter of form, Mr. Mason. We have to be sure. But Darla's mother and me, we are sure. And we're the only ones that count. Well, that's not quite true, Mr. Mason. What? Have you forgotten about the Dixons? Oh. Oh, yeah. I guess I did for a minute. Well, you go ahead. Mrs. Mason and me will be at home. Yes, sir. You'll let us know as soon as you can, Captain. Yes, ma'am. I will. Thank you. Well, Darla, now what? How far is Providence, Captain? About 40 miles. Why? Well, I don't know about that store over there, but where I came from, before a person could charge on an expensive item like a fur wrap, he'd have to produce some identification. Unless. Yeah? Unless the salesperson recognized him. Or her. What do you think? Hmm. It's 310 now. If we hurry, we might have time to do a little shopping. <laughs> made it in an hour and a half. The first salon at Kennedy's is on the second floor, back, away from the escalator. I remember her quite well, Mr. Darla. And you're sure it was Darla Mason? Oh, yes, I know, because I was so surprised to see her. Oh, how's that? <laughs> well, I read the papers, Mr. Darla. I knew she'd uh, been away. Had you ever waited on her before, Miss Trumbull? No, I had not. Do you remember how she was dressed? Mm, well, she had on a hat. Gray felt fitted real close to her head, so you couldn't see any of her hair. And, oh, yes, a navy blue dress, raw silk, I believe, and real decollete. What? Low cut, Captain. Oh. Did you recognize her when she first walked in, or not until she told you her name? Well, I... <laughs> well, you men are so picky. I don't remember everything. I'm sorry. Miss Trimble, I have two snapshots here. In a moment, I want you to tell me which of these two girls is Darla Mason. Well, that won't be hard to do. But first, may I borrow a pair of scissors and a small piece of paper, please? Mm, certainly. Here you are. Thanks. What the devil are you up to, Johnny? Cutting paper hats. What do you think? What? Come over here to the counter. Miss Trimble, if you'll just wait there a second, please. Yes, whatever you say. This had better be good. I think it will be. Now watch. All right. I put the snapshots on the counter. And on the head of each girl, 
Johnny. One of my little paper hats. Oh, really? This is ridiculous. Is it? Take a look. But I... Well, I'll be... When did you spot this? Today, at the Dixon house. Miss Trimble. Yes, sir? Would you come over now, please? Yes, sir, please. All right. Look at the snapshots and tell me which of these ladies bought that fur from you last week. Why, you've covered it up their hair. You said she wore a hat, didn't you? Yes, but... but... Which one of them was it, Miss Trimble? Well, I, I'm not sure. Uh-huh. They look so much alike with their hair covered like that. I'm just not sure. The Mason girl had worn her hair short in the Italian style. Ruth Dixon, who didn't have the money to spend on beauty parlors, had let hers grow long and full. But both girls had similar features, and apparently I was the only one who had noticed this. Or was I? Captain Miller and I went to the credit department where we compared the signature on the sales slip with Darla Mason's original credit application. After that, well, there was little doubt in our minds as to what had happened. It was almost seven when I got back to my hotel, took a shower, and stretched out to do a little thinking. Yeah, hello. Hi. Hi, yourself. Who is it? Oh, come on, Johnny. Who are you expecting? Well... Don't tell me you've forgotten about our date. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, Where shall I meet you, Miss... uh... I'll meet you. Be right up, Johnny boy. I wasn't quite dressed when she began pounding on the door. I tucked my shirt in and opened the door. Hi. Joni. Well, who else? Well, don't look so amazed. Invite me in. Oh, sorry. Come in. That's more like it. You don't mind if I leave the door open, do you? Worried, Johnny? Oh, no, no. It's just that I like lots of air. <laughs> You're cute. So are you for a 17-year-old. 18, but I'm... I'm quite sure you are. Now, uh, Joni, before we go out tonight, would you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? I thought you probably would. Oh, why? Well, I'm sure everyone in Newport knows about Darla charging that for a wrap. Oh, I see. What do you want to ask me, Johnny? It's about the day Darla disappeared. Yes. Well, you said she was in the bar with a stranger, right? That's right. But you and I, we both know that every stranger who enters the yacht club has to sign a guest book. Correct? Well, he's given a temporary card. With the name of the member who invited him to the club also registered in the book. You're very clever, Mr. Darla. Why did you lie to the police and your parents, Joni? Darla's my sister. I thought maybe someday she'd do the same for me. Will you tell me who the stranger was? Or shall I go over to the yacht club and start checking their guest book? I'll tell you. You... Yeah? Would you mind closing that door? Tell me first. His name's Peter Hanson. Who is he? My mother can answer that. Or my father. Who is he, Joni? A tutor. My mother hired him for Darla and me. He moved into our house about three months ago. Of course, he didn't stay long. Where was he from? I don't really know. But I know how you can find out. Yeah? Mother hires all her help from the Castelloni Employment Agency in Providence. If anyone has his home address, they will. I started calling the Castelloni Agency at 8.30 the next morning. Hanson's last known address was in Providence, and half an hour later I was headed toward the highway. It wasn't until I reached the turnpike that I noticed I was being followed by a battered blue sedan. Hanson had moved, but he'd left a forwarding address, and three hours and two addresses later, I turned down a lonely oyster shell road and stopped. Ahead of me, I could see a small beach cottage, and still behind me, the battered blue sedan. You make it real easy for a man to follow you, Mr. Dollar. If I had known it was you, sir, I wouldn't have. I hope you don't mind my tagging along like this. (sighs) Mr. Dixon. No, wait. I know what you're going to say. But let me say this first, Mr. Dollar. I- I've waited around, wondering if it was our girl you would find or or the other one for so long. Well, I just couldn't anymore. I had to do something. You understand that, don't you? Yes, sir, I think I do. Good. Well, then, you go on about your business, and I won't bother you. You go on up to that house, and I'll wait right here. Go on now. Yes, sir. I wasn't sure who or what I would find in that beach house. But I was sure no amount of talk could persuade Mr. Dixon to leave until I did. I knocked on the door for a good minute before it finally opened. Yeah? Mr. Hanson? Yeah, what is it? My name is Dollar. 
I'm an insurance. Insurance man? Oh, oh, oh. oh I thought... You... Honey, it's just an insurance salesman. Look, Dollar, even if I had the money, I wouldn't buy any insurance from you. You come around too early. You didn't let me finish. Huh? I'm not a salesman. I'm an investigator. Oh. Hey! Oh, no. Give it up, Hans. No! Honey! 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 You can't stop me, Hanson. Uh, you want to bet? Yeah. Grumpy, Pete, Pete, no! Oh, Pete. Oh, Pete. It'll be all right. Why did you have to find us? Why? Why did you disappear? You know how much trouble you've caused? I can read. I know. It didn't bother you? Your family not knowing whether you were dead or alive? Not a bit. I'd be happier if they thought I was dead. Oh, Dolly, you don't mean that. I proved it, didn't I? I'm not sure. Why did you disappear? Because I was bored. Tired and sick of living like my family makes me live. And how's that? Come out here. You see those birds? The seagulls, yeah. Beautiful, aren't they? You know why? All right, why? Because they're free. Because they can live any way they want with no responsibilities, no reputation to worry about. Oh, boy, how I envy them. Mr. Dollar. We're around back, sir. All right, now you tell me something. Sure. How'd you know that wasn't me they found on the beach? Because of that fur wrap you charged at Kennedy's. But how did... I told them to send the bill here. They didn't. It went to your house. Oh, no. Somebody sure goofed. Yeah, Dollar. You sure did. Mr. Dollar, are you all right? I thought... Mr. Dixon, I... Mr. Dixon? Yes, Starlin. He followed me here, hoping I'd lead him to his daughter. Oh. Gee, Mr. Dixon, I'm... I'm sorry if there's anything I can do. My daughter was fine. Decent. But you... Oh, Mr. Dixon... After what you did to your parents and to us, making us wonder for so long, not knowing whether it was you or, or our daughter who was dead. Believe me. I wish it were you. Like Bert McGraw told me a long time ago, somebody has to handle the rough ones. And for me, this was it. Henry Dixon was in no condition to drive his car, so he rode back with us. And on the way, well, Darla Mason will never forget the things he said to her. Neither will I. As for Ruth Dixon, who murdered her and why, well, that's up to the Newport police. Expense account total, including hotel bill, car rental, and transportation back to Hartford, $319 exactly. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week? Well, I suddenly found out there was more to this case I just finished. More. The really tough part. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles B. Smith, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Mary Jane Croft, Jeanette Nolan, Gene Tatum, Frank Nelson, Will Wright, Austin Green, and Marvin Miller. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.